and welcome. It's the final part of my Begonia Top 10. I'm bringing you the final plant in the list plus my Begonia Care Tips. So let's get cracking. What is the plant? It's Begonia Silver Jewel. Now I do love a bit of silver coloration and this begonia has it in spades. It's yet another rhizomatous begonia growing from that thickened underground stem and this one was hybridized in 1955 by Sue Zug and its parents are begonia postulata and begonia imperialis. Both the parents, Postulata and Imperialis, come from the Mexico and Central America segment of the Begonia genus. Postulata, that's telling us that the parent plant had postulate leaves, leaves that have that blistered effect. And indeed, Silver Jewel has inherited this trait from its parent and the leaves are also pustulate. I think in the Begonian piece I found about this hybrid, that's the Journal of the American Begonia Society, they described the leaf texture as pebbly, which is actually really rather nice. Now this piece from the Begonian, which came out in October 1981, in fact I can link to this, the Facebook version of this, which was included on the American Begonia Society website as a throwback Thursday, so I'll link to that, you can have a look at it, normally you wouldn't be able to access the Begonian archive unless, like me, you're a member of the American Begonia Society, which I'd recommend you do. And the piece notes, they can take a quite a cool greenhouse down to 56 degrees, that's 13 degrees Celsius for us Europeans, in winter without damage, although they do rest in winter as most rhizomatous begonias are inclined to do. There's not really a lot else to tell you about this begonia, it's just a pretty looking silver and green knobbly leaved begonia that is very nice and looks good with a selection of other begonia leaves it's widely available also. This is one that you will find very easily. So it's worth a mention for that regard as well. And I just think those silvery leaves are hard to top. So that's today's top 10 begonia. Begonia silver jewel. Let's now move on to the issue of how to care for these top 10 begonias and begonias more generally. Begonia is a large genus. There are lots of species that count as houseplants that we grow. So really the first thing to do is to figure out what kind of begonia you have and then proceed from there. So roughly speaking, with the 10 begonias I featured in my top 10, they're divided into three. We've got the rhizomatous begonias. Then we've got the cane types, which are begonia lucerna and begonia maculata, the polka dot begonia. And then finally, yesterday's begonia, the Thurstonii, which is a shrubby type. So really, I guess we're going to divide them into the shrubbies and the canes and then the rhizomatous because the shrubby and cane begonias kind of need the same things and then the rhizomatous, a little bit of a different care regime. For any begonia though, just have a look at it and you can figure out a lot just by looking at your plant. Leaves that are puckered, leaves that have red on them, on the undersides, hairy red stems. These are often the begonias that like the lowest light levels of the begonias. If you've got a really succulent leaf, then this might be a begonia that can dry out quite considerably. If it's a much finer leaf, like for example, begonia ferox or begonia longiciliata, the puckering makes it look thicker than it is but actually if you feel the leaf it's actually quite fine. These begonias are going to need more air humidity than the really chunky begonias. So again erythrophila of these rhizomatous begonias is so reliable and faithful just because it has such succulent leaves and that's what makes it such an easy plant to grow. So have a look at your plant first and observe what you can about how it's evolved to survive and that will help you to understand how to care for it. So let's start by talking about those rhizomatous types, which make up the majority of my top 10, including things like Masoniana, the Iron Cross Begonia, and of course, the lovely Begonia ferox, the fierce begonia with those pointy bits all over the leaves. 
How do you grow these and make them get really lush and lovely? Well, oftentimes we're thinking about humidity when it comes to begonias, and it is true, most begonias that fall into this camp will need humidity of at least 40%, 40 to 60% relative humidity is what is usually suggested. They certainly aren't things that you want to have in a very hot, stuffy room where they're right next to a radiator. They won't like that. But there are lots of things that you can do to help the plant if humidity isn't quite as high as you would like it. And I think the main thing you can do with these plants is just take a look at the substrate that they're potted in and amend that. Because the most likely scenario for your begonia is that it drops its leaves because there is just too much water around those roots. In fact, I got a message from a listener called Emily with this exact problem, a begonia masoniana. She sent me a picture looking very sad. It only had two leaves left. The stems had obviously grown quite big and then all these leaves had dropped off. And when I looked at the substrate, it looked quite clumpy, quite heavy. There was a white crust on the surface indicating the presence of an excess of mineral salts from hard water. That's why this plant has declined. It's worth remembering that these rhizomatous begonias can come back from the dead via that underground storage organ. So if you have one of these plants in this situation, don't give up. All you need to do is, well, I say all you need to do, but you need to take it out of the pot and refresh that substrate and make it more free draining. So what does that actually mean? I would advise you to get regular houseplant compost and then add a good amount, by which I mean a third of the overall volume of drainage material. Now, this idea is something that I've learned over the years from talking to begonia growers. I'm not claiming this as any great knowledge of my own. People like Jim Booman from Booman's Florals and also Tom Cranham in the UK, begonia grower extraordinaire, got me on the right path with this technique. So, your regular houseplant compost and then cut it with about a third to a half drainage material. This could be perlite, it could be a small expanded clay pebbles, it could be akadama, which you may not have heard of, but it's a tiny little clay pellet substrate that is often used in bonsai substrates and is becoming more popular for use with begonias. Again, it adds drainage, it's lightweight, it's porous. What happens when you add that drainage material in is that you can water more generously. So what happens then is if you've got hard water, the mineral salts from that water get flushed through the plant rather than sitting around and causing the plant problems because, of course, begonias haven't evolved to deal with the mineral salts in hard water. So that tends to result in browning edges to the leaves. So you need to make sure that drainage material is added and then you can water more generously. You'll find the plant dries out a bit more quickly, but of course you can water more because your potting mix is no longer sponge-like and won't be holding that water around the roots where it's going to cause rot. So when you water, where does that water go? My technique is I have a big flat bottom dish as big as you can find. And into that, I pack lots of begonia pots. At the bottom of the dish is either gravel or expanded clay pebbles, which are nice and lightweight. And when I water from the top, the water shoots through, ends up in this gravelly, pebbly mix, doesn't keep the bottom of the pots wet, but does provide a little reservoir where water could evaporate and increase humidity around the plants. Another little tip you can do, get a piece of nylon cord, sort of five to 10 centimetres long, poke that through the bottom of the drainage holes of the pot, and then the other end goes into the pebbly reservoir, and you've got yourself a wick watering scheme. Works brilliantly. And this way, as I say, you can water more often, those mineral salts get washed away, uh, you can change the pebbly reservoir whenever you need to, to freshen that up, but you will find that begonias like this kind of environment. They're grouped together. Humidity gets a bit of a boost. They aren't stressed through too much or too little water around the roots. And they can regulate their own moisture levels via that nylon wick. By the way, which you can 
buy from haberdashery stores or you can just harvest the handles from an old gift bag. They tend to be made of a nylon cord that's very suitable for this purpose. So that's what I would recommend for your rhizomatous begonias. Try this dish method and let me know how you get on and how it affects your begonias. Of course, if you can water with rainwater that doesn't have a lot of those mineral salts, even better. That will make your begonias grow even better and you won't have any problems with crispy edges because the mineral salts won't be there for the plant to uh, struggle to process. On the picture that Emily sent me, I could tell there was a problem with these mineral salts because you could see a white crust on the surface of the soil. So in Emily's case, where she's got this begonia masoniana, the iron cross begonia that has died right back, I'd take the plant out of the pot, knock off all that old substrate, have a feel of that rhizome, check it's firm. If it is firm, you can repot it into this much more free draining mix and that way the plant should start off again once uh, it's had a chance to establish there. I certainly wouldn't give up on it, Emily. Don't increase the pot size. Keep the pot size the same. It certainly doesn't need to go any bigger. And I've got lots of begonias with this dish system that are in actually ridiculously small pots um, <laughs> and they still do rather well. You could grow them, of course, in terracotta um, to aid that uh, evaporation of water. I don't do that because I find that they work perfectly well in plastic and it's more convenient you get a lighter weight uh, bowl otherwise you end up with a very very heavy bowl which you might need to uh, occasionally move around when you're cleaning and things but yeah terracotta is an option just make sure that you're uh, accommodating the fact that water is evaporating from the sides of the pot in terms of the amount of watering that you are doing so that's rhizomatous begonias when it comes to the cane and the shrub like these are a lot less worried about this free draining, very free draining substrate that I've been talking about. Certainly, I would add some perlite uh, to your mix when you are using a regular houseplant compost with these ones, but they are used to a bit of a richer environment in the soil area than the rhizomatous. Uh, it means you don't have to water quite so often but the roots won't rot as a result of being in that slightly more humusy mix. Humus being another word for the organic matter in the soil. And remember too that these begonias grow rather tall. So you might find yourself with the problem of them toppling over. You can counter this by putting some big stones either at the bottom of the pot or at the top of the pot and that way you'll weight down your plant or planting them in just a very heavy container so they can't fall over. One other issue that somebody wanted me to address was powdery mildew. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot in the way of amazing tips for this. Powdery mildew is a fungus that can affect very healthy begonia leaves and leave this white powdery stuff on them, which is the fungus itself. Now, I would honestly say if you start getting this problem with your plants, I would chuck them away and start again. You can spend an awfully long time trying to fix this problem with fungicide sprays, but oftentimes it has absolutely no effect and the problem will just keep on coming back. This is a good reason to keep taking cuttings of your plants and have a backup collection somewhere else in your home so that you're not relying on one set of plants for success. But powdery mildew is a real problem and it's hard to fix. You can try taking a load of the damaged foliage off the plant and seeing if it will revive itself. Keeping it in a good shape will help, as will promptly removing any dead or dying or damaged plant material and making sure there's good air circulation. But honestly, if you get powdery mildew and it's a bad case, you might just want to start again. I hope this has been helpful, my top 10 begonia rundown and some tips there. I'd love to know if there's anything I've missed out. What else can I add? Are there any plants that I haven't mentioned that you think deserve a place in the top 10? Drop me a line to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. Oh, and there's a trailer coming up at the end of this show for another podcast that I appear in. It's Our Plant Stories Pick of the Year featuring me and a couple of other podcasters. Definitely worth a listen to that trailer, so 
don't take your headphones off quite yet. Well, that's all for this week's show. And remember, begin with a begonia and you can't go far wrong. Bye! The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops and Whistle by Benjamin Banger. Both tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details. Welcome to this special edition of Our Plant Stories. We've got loads of plant stories, but not just from this podcast, but from three other podcasts too. Whenever you read about garden wildlife, do you ever, ever see a spider mentioned? No. And he just talked so warmly about trees. And I don't mind if I'm talking about composting human poo, and I don't mind if I'm talking about bees, and I don't mind if I'm talking about witches, like anything goes, as long as it relates in some way to gardening or to being outdoors. In a former life, working as a BBC radio producer, I sometimes got to produce the Radio 4 Pick of the Week programme, highlights from the week's broadcasting. And if you were really lucky, you got to produce Pick of the Year. So I thought, why not do it here? I contacted three other plant podcast presenters and asked if they fancy being a part of it. And they all said yes. Though one did tell me it was a bit like being asked to pick her favourite child. So whether you're spending time in the kitchen or out in the garden planting the last few bulbs or driving around as we all do at this time of year, I hope you will enjoy this episode and have some new podcasts to check out too.